Hello, peoples, and welcome back to another episode of Esoterica Cinema, the podcast where we take films from the cinematic multiverse and discuss the hell out of them. I am the creepy man in the unmarked van, Ryan Siebold, coming at you with another I Got Five on It five minute mini review. Today's film is Black Phone from 2022. Directed by Scott Derrickson, this film raked in a box office of $160 million on a budget of $16 mil. Good on him. And this movie is based on a short story by Joe Hill, who is Stephen King's kid. This film stars Ethan Hawke, Mason Thames, and Madeline McGraw. Now, normally we keep this podcast mostly spoiler-free, but to truly talk about this film, I'm going to get into some pretty deep spoilers. So if you want to go into this movie blind, go see this movie, come back, listen to me ramble, and see if you agree with me. Google has this summarized as... Finney Shaw is a shy but clever 13-year-old boy who is being held in a soundproof basement by a sadistic masked killer. When a disconnected phone on the wall starts to ring, he soon discovers that he could hear the voices of the murderer's previous victims, and they are dead set (laughs) on making sure that what happened to them doesn't happen to Finney. And just like that, I've spoiled the whole movie for you, because I'm telling you, that's really all that happens here. There's not a whole lot more to it. The film opens with a considerable amount of world building, showing the rough and tumble late 1970s in North Denver, where Scott Derrickson grew up, though this film was shot in Wilmington, North Carolina. I really enjoyed this part of the film, as it showed the seedy underbelly to free-range parenting of the late 70s and early 80s. This era is normally demonstrated in shows like Wonder Years, Stranger Things, or even movies like Goonies, where kids are free to ride their bikes around town, go flirt with their school crushes at the mall, and just be home by dark. But not Derrickson's North Denver, the late 70s, man. This is like the Warriors for kids, loaded with brutal bullies and abusive alcoholic parents, namely our protagonist kid's father, played by Jeremy Davies, who provided some of the hardest scenes to watch in this film, which, for a movie about a serial killer murdering children, is saying something. There should be a trigger warning on this. I think this is why it's rated R, because there are some really hard-to-watch child abuse scenes in this film. Now, in this scary world for children, it feels very natural to progress to finding out that kids are going missing, being taken, and assumed to be murdered by someone the community has dubbed the Grabber. This starts out as a bit of a subplot in the film, being told to us by things like flyers stapled to telephone poles and discussed by the kids, and works its way closer and closer to the circle of our children protagonists, Finney and his sister Gwen, until Finney's best friend gets kidnapped, and then eventually Finney gets taken. And that's what takes us into Act 2. Our main character Finney is confronted by a man in a black van, is drugged by some kind of chloroform spray, and wakes up in the man's dank basement. Tale as old as time. (laughs) Now normally in an act two like this, I'd say this is where the movie really ramps up. Suspense, horror, blah, blah, blah. But this is where the movie really fell flat for me. Right off the bat, we're introduced to the killer, The Grabber, played wonderfully by Ethan Hawke. He crushes his performance. Most of it done under a variety of face masks, all designed by horror legend Tom Savini, which I thought was pretty cool. Ethan Hawke does about all he can with this character, but in all fairness, he's not in the movie very much. He's alluded to through the first act, then he finally shows up, but most of this movie is kept with both Finney and Gwen, and the grabber just kind of comes downstairs in the basement to check on him every once in a while and talk about the things he's going to do. I'd even argue that the grabber's pretty nice to Finney throughout the film. He makes him meals throughout the day, brings him sodas, chats with him a bit... Especially compared to his abusive father back home who's been beating the crap out of him through Act 1, I think he's got it pretty good down there. I mean, aside from the old untimely death thing at the end. (laughs) But then the film takes a hard right turn, and supernatural elements are just introduced out of nowhere, unless I miss something in Act 1. The dank basement Finney is being kept in has a black rotary phone mounted to the wall, which he is told by the grabber no longer works. In a room with just a mattress on the floor and a toilet in the corner, it's odd that he left this phone there, but whatever. Of course, shortly after the kidnapper leaves the basement, the phone starts to ring, as one by one, his dead child victims call Finney and start to give him clues on how to get out of this mess. On the other end of the story, Finney's sister Gwen is back home, haunted by vivid and sometimes prophetic dreams about the killer and the murders and the kidnappings that allow her to gather pieces and clues about this whole situation that she's able to take back to the police and solve this crime. She's like 10 years old, and she's like a kid psychic police informant of some kind. Then the movie just starts to repeat itself for a while. The grabber comes downstairs, brings Finney some food, talks to him for a bit, he leaves, Finney gets a phone call, one of his old homies, who he's never surprised to hear from. Hey, it's Jason the Paperboy. Hey, what up, Jason? How's death? Oh, you know, kind of shitty. Hey, look, I don't have long, so let me tell you about this hole I was digging over by the toilet. You could totally use it to trap the grabber guy. Oh, no smoke? Yeah, man, I'm serious. And on and on it goes. He's even called by his best friend that got kidnapped right before him and taught by his dead friend ghost how to fight. There's a borderline fighting montage. Step back, dodge, punch, punch, step back, dodge. It's like, come on, man. 
Ghost fighting montage? Ugh. Throughout this whole process, Finney never really seemed scared down there in the basement. I guess because his alternative is his abusive father back home, so he's seen worse. And I get it, you can't show 13 year old kids being chopped up and murdered. No one wants to see that, nor should they. But without some killings, you kind of don't have a horror. It's a suspense movie? Kinda? And these supernatural elements come in so randomly that they seem to act as more or less a cheat code for the writers. Anytime you get to any kind of all is lost moment for our protagonist Finney in the basement, these ghosts just call him up out of nowhere and give him clues on how to get out of it. Even down to giving him the code on the lock on the door, or telling him things they left behind, or ways that they were trying to escape but only got halfway there. But all these things culminate in the very end, as Finney is able to piece together multiple traps and things that he could do to the grabber to get himself out of this. Meanwhile, his 10-year-old sister Gwen's psychic X-Files extravaganza that's going on as a subplot to all this leads the cops to the house so they're able to get the kid out of there. Now, as I stated, this was based on a short story. The original text was 30 pages, which at that length probably kept the foot on the gas a little more, kept things nice and tight, let the suspense build, and you're out. But they punched a 30-page story into an hour and 42-minute film, and I'm just not sure this was the best way to tell that story. I don't know. Also, admittedly, Joe Hill's dad, Stephen King's work, doesn't always translate into film as well, so maybe it's another one of those type scenarios. My three adjectives are inconsistent. From the street level opening into the supernatural moving into act two to the child murdering serial killer, but also kind of nice sometimes, Ethan Hawke. I feel like this movie was just inconsistent. Even so much as how it's dubbed a horror and I never really felt scared or threatened in any way. I think there were maybe two jump scares in the whole thing, but they weren't that scary. It was just like ghost kids showing up as they were talking to homie on the phone in the basement. My second adjective in the compliment sandwich is well made because this is a well made film. I had some problems with this story, but I'll tell you. Ethan Hawke crushed his performance as the grabber in this film, to the point where I wished he was in it more. His performance was dope, the mask was dope, and as the main antagonist in the film, I just wish there was more antagonizing? I don't know. I didn't really get to talk about it, but the cinematography is sick, done by a DP named Brett Jokowitz. He gave this film a very vintage 1970s feel, without the film feeling desaturated or low contrast, as sometimes those are the cheat codes to making a film feel old. For the film nerds in the audience, he shot this with Airy Alexa minis and a set of Hawk V-Lite anamorphic lenses. Then he went to go shoot all the dream sequences and kidnapping sequences with a Super 8 film camera. But yeah, the acting was great, the violence felt violent, the world was very well fleshed out. My main problem with this just has to do with story, plot design, and how they wrapped it all up. But that's what we're doing here, right? We're storytellers. So I got really nothing to hang my hat on with this film. <laughs> And my last one, I couldn't decide which of these two words to use, so I went with bloated and repetitious, which both are just two sides of the same coin, right? Act one was just a gritty reboot of the Hard Knock Life musical scene from Little Orphan Annie, where bully after bully would come in and scenes of abuse would repeat themselves. Then you get to act two, which is just ghost pen pals, where this kid just picks up the phone in this dank basement and talks to all his dead homies that give him tips and tricks on how to get out of this bucket of syrup. Then you got act three, which is just creepy home alone, where all these traps he set kind of enact themselves and play out one by one, Till he kills the killer, sister leads the cops in, and we're out. But yeah, it's very repetitious. The whole thing could have been tightened up quite a bit. Also, I wanted more grabber. More Ethan Hawke, always good stuff. I'm giving this movie a C-. minus. It's not terrible, it's well made, but I probably won't watch it again. But yeah, C- minus film. Well, that's my review for Black Phone. Make sure to tune in next week for another episode of Esoterica Cinema!